Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Pastor Study. It's Friday, Ask the Pastor. We're going to be working through um, an introduction to the Gospel of Matthew, as I mentioned on Wednesday. So, a little bit about the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> first of the books of the New Testament, first of the four Gospels. It has a very unique place in the New Testament canon. One of the things I really find fascinating about the Gospel of Matthew is its first place in the canon. And typically in antiquity, if you ask which was the first gospel written, they would tell you it was Matthew. Matthew was followed by Mark, and then Luke, and then John. Now, as we went through last week on Friday, that typically isn't how we look at this. Today, in modern scholarship, we assume that Mark is written first, followed by Matthew and Luke, and then John. But because of its position in the canon, Mark, or Matthew gets a lot of attention. The three most commonly read books in the, New Te in the Bible, Genesis, Matthew, and Revelation. Why Genesis? Well, if you're going to start to read the Bible, where do you start? Well, you start at the beginning. What's the beginning? Genesis. Well, if you don't want to read the whole Bible, that seems too daunting a task. Well, where do you start? Well, you start with the New Testament. And we're going to start in the New Testament. Well, you're going to start with Matthew. So, well, then there's Revelation. Revelation is the third of the most commonly read books of the Bible. Why do people read Revelation? Well, everybody knows how the story ends. And, well, Revelation is mysterious and all kinds of fun things like that. You can find some great charts to help you understand it. Sometimes, well, I shouldn't say understand it. It'll give you a specific understanding. It may not be the most helpful. At any rate... Matthew provides some of our most commonly used material from the New Testament, the Lord's Prayer, for example. Um, but you also find the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most commonly quoted passages, a, a collection of the sayings of Jesus, and it is well known. <clears throat> so let's talk about... Well, the Gospel itself... write this gospel. It doesn't say that. Never does. There is nowhere in the text that lays claim to Matthew as its author. However, in the early church, this book got its name because it was written in Greek according to Matthew. The understanding was that this was Matthew's account of Jesus' life. Now, as I said last week on Ask the Pastor, dealing with the Synoptic Gospels, modern critical studies, and particularly those, we find the assumption here that Mark writes first, followed by Matthew and Luke. And we went over that with some more detail. Now, who is this Matthew? Matthew is typically assumed to be one of the 12 disciples or the 12 apostles, and that he was an eyewitness to these events. Now, why would Matthew and I witness depend on Mark's account? Well, won't it be simply that he agrees with Mark's account of things? There was no need to reinvent the wheel. But it's also important to remember, while Matthew reproduces somewhere between 60 and 70% of Mark, keeping the same chronology, there's a great deal of material that is different. For example, you won't find the Sermon on the Mount in Mark. In fact, you won't find many big teaching sections by Jesus in Mark. You'll find miracles, you'll find his baptism, but you won't find his birth. That you do find, however, in Matthew. The other thing is, depending on where you close the, the Gospel of Mark, where the ending happens to be. Is it a shorter ending? Is it a longer ending? Or is it where we add the shorter and the longer ending? If you take the third option, then Mark has no resurrection accounts. And Matthew very clearly does. So while indeed there are similarities, and even roughly, like I said, 60 to 70 percent of Mark is reproduced in Matthew, it is not a carbon copy. 
even that material is altered and rearranged at points to suit the telling that Matthew wishes. Now, when does this happen? When does Matthew write? If you ask me to detail this, I'm going to push for somewhere around 60, 65, 67 at the latest. Now, there are a lot of different ways to think about this. I tend to think of Mark somewhere around 55, and Matthew somewhere in the early 60s. Why this? Well, Matthew was among the older of the disciples as we go through the stories, and at this point by 70, that's 40 years after Jesus' resurrection, Matthew's an old man. How much longer will he live? If it's not written yet, when will he get to it? The other thing that happens in 70 AD is the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the general Titus and his army, his legions, come in, and while his intent was not to destroy the temple, the temple is destroyed, the city is destroyed, and there's no mention at all of this happening in Matthew. Had it been written after 70, you'd think that there would be some, at least a scribal comment saying that these things came to pass just as Jesus said they would. I mean, this, this causes a major reordering in Judaism and the birth of rabbinical Judaism in the Council of Jamnia. But it also means that the Church of Jerusalem, which has been the mother church, the place where everyone went to have questions answered about how we do this Christian thing, is disbanded or scattered. Again, you would think that these, ish, these events would warrant some sort of mention, but they don't. They don't show up at all. Now, there are legends about what language the Gospel of Matthew is first written in. If you ask most people, they say Greek. And if you ask me on a, any given day, what language was Matthew first written in, I will probably say Greek. However, there are these intriguing suggestions that Matthew was first written in Hebrew. I know. It's intriguing. So there was an early church father from Alexandria who had gone to visit the church in India. The, the Apostle Thomas had gone to India and established Christianity there. I'm assuming most likely along the trading routes that already existed between India and the Holy Land. And there were Jewish communities in India at the time just as there are today. This is nothing new. And where would Titus go first? Well, much like Paul did to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Now, what language would they have spoken in worship? Uh, either Hebrew or Aramaic. And here's the interesting thing. An early church father had gone from Alexandria to India to visit the church there, and they presented him a copy of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew and said to take it back because no one there could read it anymore. Well, what happened is they had moved to the local languages and Hebrew wasn't being spoken and the worship of the church was no longer being done in Aramaic or in Hebrew and nobody in the community could read it. So it came back. Now there's nothing terribly surprising about a change in language, but there's this mention of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. Now, sometime later during the medieval period, there is a Spanish Jewish scholar who attacks Christianity based on a Hebrew copy of the Gospel of Matthew. Those are the two that I'm aware of. Now, some have said that these Gospels that we're talking about aren't really the Gospel of Matthew as we know it, but rather the Gospel of the Ebionites or the the church, as it left Jerusalem in 70 AD, they settled into Pella. And there they were known as Ebionites, and this gospel, a very Jewish gospel, is written in either Aramaic or in Hebrew. And whether or not that's the source of these stories, it could be. 
Now, if you want to ask questions, well, how do we know that it was first written in Greek as opposed to Hebrew? Well, there's one other thing that we can talk about, and that's this, that all of the earliest copies of Matthew that we have are all in Greek. Not in Hebrew, not in Aramaic, but in Greek. Now, Matthew does bear some telltale signs of Hebrew or Aramaic grammatical construction in its Greek. However, these are typically found in the oldest content within the Gospel itself. In other words, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, the sayings of Jesus that are recorded in Matthew's Gospel, these things that Jesus spoke repeatedly and often are translated from Aramaic or Hebrew into Greek, but using Aramaic or Hebrew sentence structure and not Greek sentence structure. And so it sounds odd in Greek. Now, that could be a sign that this was first written in Hebrew. But, here's the, the problem with that. The other parts of the narrative that are not sayings of Jesus don't have the same archaic sentence structure. So, again, if you ask me, while I find this an interesting, fascinating story about Matthew's Gospel, ultimately going to come back and say, this was first written in Greek, not in Hebrew. Well, like anything that you write, you typically have an audience that you write for, and this is no difference. Matthew had an audience as well. His was a Greek-speaking audience because he wrote in Greek. But it was also a Jewish community, but they were Greek-speaking. If you go to the, the Acts of the Apostles, you find this tension between the, the Greek Jews and the Hebraic Jews. In other words, those who are linguistically Greek, but religiously and ethnically Jewish, and those who are linguistically Aramaic or Hebrew, religiously and ethnically Jewish. So we're talking about people who are ethnically Jewish. One group speaks Greek, one group speaks Hebrew. Matthew is writing for that Greek-speaking community. Why? Well, Matthew shows a concern with the the Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled by Jesus. There are quotations, there are allusions, and there are more in Matthew than in any other New Testament document. If you want to understand how the early church read and understood the Old Testament, Matthew and Hebrews provide the best tools for doing that. Again, if you look, where does Matthew trace Jesus' lineage from? From Abraham. Unlike Luke, who traces Jewish, Jesus' lineage from Adam. Matthew never bothers to explain Jewish customs, which are explained in Mark. He uses Jewish terminology like the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God like you would find in Luke. Matthew has a, a reluctance to use the divine name. So he says kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. Again, you will see an emphasis on the son of David. This again points to that, that Jewishness of, of the gospel. Now, this does not mean, however, that Matthew restricts his gospel to just those who are ethnically Jewish. In fact, he recounts the coming of the Magi, Gentiles, non-Jews, to worship Jesus as an infant. But he also is very clear in stating in Matthew Jesus' great commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all men, not just Jewish men. However, it seems the gospel was originally written for those who came from a Jewish background. Or perhaps even were still Jewish and this was an attempt to convert. Matthew's main purpose <clears throat> seems to be to prove to Jewish readers that Jesus is the Messiah. He does this by showing 
Jesus in his life and ministry in well uh, as a fulfillment uh, as a fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. Um, he also stylized with Jesus perhaps as Moses. Now that may sound like a strange thing to say, but if you look at the structure of the Gospel of Matthew, it's broken into five really handy sections. Chapters 5 through 7, chapter 10. You know what, I'm not going to bother with that now. I'll, I'll put it in notes later. But in the five sections, just like in the Old Testament, you find the Pentateuch, the five sections of the law, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Here we have five sections in the book of um, Matthew. Where does Moses go when he's giving the law? He goes up on the mountain. Where does Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount from? He goes up on the mountain. Jesus, in many ways, is presented in Matthew's Gospel as the new Moses. And with that, there is leading God's people to the Promised Land. You can find all kinds of interesting things to explore in the Gospel of Matthew. I hope some of this helps to put things into context and helps you to make sense of reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and seeing the unique flavor of each and the purpose that they have. Brothers and sisters, I hope you have a great week. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday for worship. Peace.